Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Lee Kurzel from ERM. Did you know Dataversity offers free monthly webinar series and online conferences throughout the year? Stay in the loop when you follow us on Twitter at Dataversity or on Instagram at Dataversity underscore EDU. Get podcast extras and bonus content when you subscribe to our channel at youtube.com slash Dataversity. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Lee Kurzel a principal consultant at ERM, and normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Lee, hello and welcome. Hello, thank you. It's great to be here. Oh, so glad you could join us Um, and so glad that we met up with you at DGIQ to invite you to be in this podcast. Thank you for saying yes. DGIQ is one of our conferences, Data Governance and Information Quality Conference in San Diego. Um, Yeah, so, so much fun. Okay, so tell me, so you're the principal consultant at ERM. Tell me about ERM and and what ERM does. So ERM, it stands for, it's environmental management. Mm -hmm. Like the focus is they are like, we are the only pure play sustainability management company. And we've been here since the beginning of looking at sustainability. So we were established in 1971. We've been around for more than 50 years, almost as long as I've been around, (laughs) a little longer. Um, And it really, the biggest thing that we can say about our company is we work with all of our clients. We're global, 8,000 employees. It's a very technical consulting firm. We focus on operationalizing sustainability. And so what you do that can look at, okay, how are we do, doing that on the ground? We talk a lot about boots to the boardroom that we you know, work on the ground all the way up to the C-suite to get everybody on the same page when it comes to sustainability. But it also has a huge data component to it because environmental itself generates so much data And so being able to utilize that to be able to support through environmental sustainability data governance is really a huge thing. And it's something that these clients are, that it's information that they're going to have to report on, not just internally to their company, but they have to report on publicly that they have to, that goes to financing companies. So it's something that is becoming more and more important to be able to say, what is the truth behind the data that you are giving me? What is the governance behind that metric? And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, we come to DJQ, we want to get more information. We want to make sure that we stay on that, you know, bleeding edge of what is being done. But we also like to, we're speaking at DJQ because a lot of companies aren't thinking about the governance behind this information they are potentially reporting out. In a public environment, companies are used to reporting information internal. That publicly reported is really uncomfortable. So we're hoping to be able to say, okay, there are people that expertise in this. This is their technical field. So typically we look at, and it's things where we're working with environmental health and safety and risk management. Those are kind of the buckets that we fall under, but it's across all industries. So everything from mining to manufacturing to a chemical company, just all over the place. Oh, that's very cool. That is really, I love all the different industries that data gets into. There's not one it doesn't touch, right? So yeah, so so what is it that you do um, for ERM as a principal consultant? So we have different, you know, I'm principal consultant, I'm considered kind of the senior consultant level. Mm -hmm. And so my, uh, one of the questions, three questions you had said, you know, what does a, a week look like in my work? It's really diverse. So it appeals to that kind of, I like to do a lot of different things. I don't want to get bored. 
Mm -hmm. um, I get to do everything from talking to clients to say, okay, I think I have this issue. Can you help me brainstorm it? Mm -hmm. So design what their data governance could look like overall. Where do they potentially look for gaps in their governance plans? Or what can we do to help them operationalize their governance? They have this great governance that has been handed down from their higher governance, but how do I actually implement that, operationalize it at the manufacturing level, at the floor, on where the boots are? So it is taking governance itself and being able to turn it into a usable tool for people that they want to use. So a big, that's one of the reasons why when we were speaking, we were speaking about putting the people at the center of our governance. And it's because we don't want to be the police. We don't want to be seen as the police. And we don't want governance work to be seen as the police. We're trying and we're succeeding in helping our clients to recognize we're here to make it more efficient because the ask of you are going to get more complex and bigger. So we operationalize, we make automatic as much governance as we possibly can. And that's actually a really big area that we're doing. And it's not, it's not relying on AI and everything. It's just doing things where, okay, how can we make automatic metadata generation? So instead of a person having to think of all of their metadata, as we're loading the document into the official library and document manager system, how can we create some automatic workflows from out of the box platforms that you have access to everywhere so that it gives them basically, okay, here's all of the metadata that this syntax, which comes from Microsoft, which everybody that's a Microsoft house can have access to, what's it gonna tell us? And then you can click on and off and say, nope, those aren't appropriate, these are appropriate. And now it makes it easier to find that document in a storage system. So, I love that. So you're automating some things for your customers, but you still drive home the importance of people. Yes. Because and people are part of that. Yes. If we aren't doing that, then we give them a great plan. We give them a great um, operational plan for working with this. And it just sits there yeah. because they're going at a thousand miles an hour. We have to make sure that our data governance moves as fast as they do and helps them move faster. Mm, so important. I yes. love that. Well, let's get back to that a little bit. Um, so tell me, Lee, when you were very young, just a kid, <laughs> was this the dream? I'm going to be a principal Ooh. consultant when I grow up working with data governance. <laughs> well, <laughs> what was I, the dream? <laughs> if you look me up, I'm, I'm totally, it's so, it was not a straight line to get here at all. Yeah. Um, this is actually working in environmental um, and under the label of data governance. This is my second career. So I actually, and I've been doing under that label for the last five years. Prior to that, I actually worked in healthcare. And oh. I worked in healthcare, um, but the thing that I loved doing, so I worked in healthcare for 20, almost 25 years. And at a director level, so management level, and in my career is when we went from paper charts to electronic medical charts. That was an entire exercise in massive data governance because there are so many terms to describe what this is. Yeah. And getting physicians to agree on what this is, is the epitome of governance. And that's what you had to do for to get people, they were, everybody was used to writing what they wanted to write. In a, in a paper medical chart, but you had to standardize that into an electronic medical chart. And then we went to value-based pricing for medical services. Now, what the, the doctor getting paid is completely dependent on what he wrote in the chart, complying with what they said they were going to put in the chart or what they said they did. Yeah. So it was 20 years of developing and working through that on, and it had to be people at the center. I, the entire time, even though I wasn't calling it data governance, we were talking about, we were calling it digitizing the medical record for the 15 years that we did that. Mm -hmm. It was all governance work and it was all working with, you cannot, in the United States, you can't tell a physician how to practice medicine. So it was very conscientious about the verbiage is using and how we're saying, okay, we have to help you document so that the system 
recognizes that what you said you did, you did. And th- it opened my eyes. I loved doing it. It was like the smallest part of what I was supposed to be doing for my entire career. Yeah. And I, like a lot of people in healthcare, you get burned out on it because it is an entire career of banging your head against a wall. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I understand. Is, so when you're in, you know, you're in your late forties and you're like, okay, I want to switch careers. And you're like, oh God, how am I going to switch careers? <laughs> that really hard look at what did I love yeah what did I love to do and it was all Mm. data government's work it was data it was helping people be able to tell their story so Mm -hmm. it was data visualization it was it it was all of that and that's where I went out and pursued it and I went into a field that environmental and sustainability they're not at the point of being on paper medical charts but they are in this journey you're going to see my shadow of my dog jumping down behind me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they are in this journey of digitizing. They, they are, yeah. There are pieces of the environmental field that is heavily digitized and there are pieces that aren't. Yeah. So then putting that governance in as well. Yeah, no, yeah. And that's, that's so fascinating. And I love that because yeah, th- there is a lot of data governance, whether they call it that or not in healthcare. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And I love that became, it became a passion of yours that you followed. So backing up even further, you know, I mean, I know like when I wanted to grow up, I wanted to be Wonder Woman, maybe not really a realistic goal. Um, <laughs> I really wanted those bracelets, though, you know, that reflect yes. bullets, right? Oh, <laughs> it, really just cool. made, it just seems and the the last one. Yeah, right. But so so what was the dream? So let's back it up even further, you know, like, you know, before you got even got into healthcare, you know, what was the dream and and what, what was the journey from there? I wasn't going to go into healthcare. I yeah. that was just like coming into environmental data governance. It, yeah. was, it was a quirk. So I was actually working on my master's and going through my PhD in sociology. I was specifically studying social uh-huh. statistics and research methods. And I was wow. you know, this was back in the mid nineties. Uh-huh. So I was it because up in USA Today, you know, everybody was reading the USA Today paper. <laughs> talk and all of the place and had all of these statistics in it and it right. drove me bonkers that my cohort my age group was going well this president like ability statistic says this and I'm like you can make a statistic say anything <laughs> right. it's anything <laughs> it is the implementation and so I literally wanted to go to teach so that there wouldn't be generations after me they would look at statistics with a very eye instead of just absorbing mm-hmm. it, was, it was the first summer between my my so it was after my first year and of course you know you have your teaching assistant and your research assistantships but those only go during the school year so then you yeah. gotta figure out you gotta earn a bunch of money in the summer to help pay for the next year right and i took a temporary job in a um medical facility in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting, I was worked as a secretary. And so I was working as a secretary and I was literally taking minutes in a medical director meeting. Uh-huh. And this was truly when they were like the people 2000 was a goal of being able to measure the effectiveness of the physician. It, was just, it had not been done prior to that. Nobody, yeah. There was no public information. All of these things that we have access to now didn't exist. And it was the goal was to try to encourage the medical profession to get to those people 2000 goals and i'm sitting there all these medical directors are talking and they're basically and it's of different specialties and they're saying well you can't you can't measure who a good doctor is now keep in mind i've always been like this so i'm supposed to be taking notes because i'm the secretary in the meeting and i'm just sitting there i said oh sure you can whole room turns and looks at me. <laughs> it actually turned into my master's thesis. Oh, wow. Because it truly was, this was like a community health practice. It was yeah. multiple primary care specialties. They, to get public dollars, they really had to be able to show their practice. And in that first conversation, I was asking questions about, you know, how do you 
you guys know who a good doctor is because you know who you would send mm -hmm. your mother to. We ask questions like that. We generate those kind of things in our satisfaction surveys. We look at, there are statistics that you expect for being a good doctor. And we build those out of what they're documenting in their charts. And so it turned into my master's thesis. I never went back. I finished my master's. I didn't go finish my PhD. And I stayed in healthcare then for the next 20 years. Wow. Doing practical application of research methods. I was, I truly was operationalizing yes. how you do, a, you develop a good metric. In yes. reality, I'm still doing that. Right. What's the sustainability? What they're wanting us to develop governance for is how do I have a reliable metric that I am comfortable reporting to the public or my financial institute? I'm still doing okay. it. That is super oh, cool. <laughs> this, uh, it's just, that is truly a journey of following your passion. Yes. It's, that is really cool. And you've been really immersed in data since the beginning. I mean, yes. going after statistical analysis uh, and I, I, that's very impressive. I, I love that story. And I love that yeah. you spoke up, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a habit of doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> I think there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, look where it got you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is so cool that it, it turned, speaking up resulted in an idea for your thesis and started your career. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and it's, and okay, and I have to pause because we at Data Diversity are huge animal fans. So <laughs> we got somebody talking there. I, I need to see the dog. She is, <laughs> she's right behind me. She's got a giant cone of shame. <laughs> She is hugely allergic. She's on every allergy medicine and specialty food, oh. and she still has allergy reactions. So she wears a cone of shame. It is we've oh. like dolled it up for her. Oh, I love that. Yes, there you go. <laughs> we'll play later. <laughs> it's three o'clock. It's time to go for a walk. Yeah, I understand schedules, <laughs> routines. Exactly. <laughs> so I apologize. It, hopefully, the, you can block out the sound of her barking. Oh gosh, you know this is the world we live in now, right? It is. Yeah. So no worries at all. Again, we're huge animal fans here at Dataversity. So, okay. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we all have animals. They often join our moves. <laughs> she joins a lot of mine. Everybody yep. knows her name is Cindy Lou Who. So um, there's, a, she, there's a big recliner behind me, and she'll like jump down <laughs> in the middle of a call. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I love the name too. <laughs> yes, she is uh, both of our dogs are rescues and that's yeah. the name she came with. Um, oh. The only thing we know, I'm in Michigan and she came from Detroit and the only thing she came with was the name Cindy Lou who we don't know anything about her, <laughs> but she's adorable. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, all right. Well, to continue our data journey, that <laughs> Thank you for a little pause. <laughs> Absolutely. Doggy pause is always appropriate. Very important. <laughs> With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launch pad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. So, so, so tell me, Lee, so what, uh, what was your biggest lesson so far in your career that you kind of take with you and, and, and maybe even uh, advise, use to advise other people? Two important lessons. And I've just, I've mentioned both of them already. Don't be afraid to speak up. Mm -hmm. If you know what you're talking about, then talk about it. Awesome. Yeah. And the second one is, don't be afraid to walk away. Mm -hmm. I spent probably five years longer in healthcare than was truly good for my mental health and my physical health. I didn't, I should have left sooner, but I was truly, I had bought into the, the I, what else can I do? This, I'm, you know, 48 years old. I can't, what, can't go to anywhere else. You can't transition at this age. Uh, yeah. I bought into all of that. And I, I got reached a point where I said, okay, no, 
I am old, I changed the verbiage to I'm only 48 years old. Knowing myself, I'm going to work for at least another 20 years and I'm not going to do it like this. Oh, so, I love that. You really changed the, the, the inner dialogue yes. for yourself from negative to positive. That's hard too. It's very difficult. It, it was, you go through, and that's part of, you know, one of the other things I like talking to people that I mentor is you, you go through, allow yourself to go through the emotions. You're going to mourn. You walk mm-hmm. away, then mourn it, mm-hmm. set a limit on that, and then dig in. And the biggest way you can dig in is figure out who you are. What makes you excited to get right. out? Yeah. Oh, in- yeah. <laughs> that is Sorry. that's those are two great lessons and really great advice. Yeah. So tell me then, so having worked with data so long, uh, you know, what is your definition of data and and how do you work with it? So my definition is going to be very broad. Uh-huh. And it's because, and out of necessity. If we broaden, if we use the definition of data where it is anything that helps you make an informed decision. Yeah. If I go to with internal to my my field, internal to data governance, and or inter or external to clients, and I put it in that framework, of what do you need to interact with to make informed decisions? Not just gut decisions, but informed decisions. Mm-hmm. It helps them to recognize data where they don't think of it as being data. And that's the biggest thing, especially in a field like I had to do it in healthcare and I'm doing it in environmental, is getting people to recognize what you're interacting with is all data, which means it all needs to have standardization around it. You need to be able to reliably say this was not garbage in, garbage out, and this is why. I so like it. It's, yeah. it's very broad. I deliberately so because it helps for me. It helps me to reach the people that go, oh, this is a data work. Yep, it is. And here's why. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. So, um, you know, and we've talked a little bit already about how you how you work with it and how you work mm-hmm. with your clients with it. Um, but, you know, so let me kind of move on to, the, you know, how having been so immersed in data for so long um, and through most of your career, even, even unintentionally in, in, yes. when you're in healthcare, um, you know, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Increasing, definitely increasing. And part of it is increasing because we are generating so much data. Mm-hmm. And we are, there's, if you watch on LinkedIn, especially if you like try to follow sustainability and data Mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, there are more and more articles talking about the environmental impact of all of the data that we're generating. So Mm -hmm. it's one of the things that um, we spoke a little bit about at DGIQ. We're going to present, we're going to include, we're going to try to do another speak that'll be more focused on that. Awesome. Yeah. And it's, I think that as we as, a, as humans focus more and more on the sustainability of our work and reducing carbon footprint, it isn't just, you know, we need to, okay, let's get rid of refineries. It's also, okay, we're generating huge amounts of data that is stored somewhere. The cloud is actually a cloud. It is a server farm somewhere, which means it is having a global impact. So how do we actually get smart about data? The way to get smart about data is to govern it. Like you get smart retention plans. You stick with the retention plans. You get smart. Um, you get smart about duplicate analysis. It, it's something that I think should be very obvious that mm-hmm. there isn't a plan around to actually go through and find out. Okay, where are you replicating data? And it's all over the place. Huge amount. Why is it being replicated? Oh, we just want to make sure we have a backup. Okay, that backup is generating towards your company's carbon footprint. So is it really necessary to have that backup? Or do you need to talk to IT so that you feel more comfortable about their their methods of supporting your data? Mm -hmm. So I think we will see those 
my two passions, the environmental impact and data, getting closer and closer and getting more intertwined. Mm -hmm. I think that the fact that we now have this, the formalization of what are the different areas under data management and data governance allow us to then go to people going, okay, you don't have to be this quirky outgoing person like Lee Kurzweil to be in data governance. You can, that there's a role for all personalities. There's a role right. for all learning styles. There's a role for all communicating styles. And it is as broad as we want to make it. So yeah. I, I don't, I, it is going to keep increasing and we're going to need generalists, which is what I tend to consider myself. I have a love for metadata just because it makes it easy for me to work with my, it's an easy thing for my clients to hang their hats on. Mm -hmm. But I know a little bit about everything, which is how I can help them develop an overarching plan. And we're going to need specialists, those people that can go in and dig into, okay, where in your architecture have you created redundancies that aren't needed? Mm -hmm. And put that under the guise of sustainability. Yeah, it's very, very true. So what advice would you give to people then who are looking to get into data management for the first time, you know, it, with that broad spectrum? And, you know, like you say, it can fit so many different personalities. Yes. There's so many different aspects. So, so how do people explore that? My advice is actually, it's what I literally tell everyone because we're talking, we're, people in environmental and ERM, they come into data from other parts of the environmental world. So we've got geologists, we've got biologists, we've got all of these, and engineers, mm -hmm. and those who are who become our data people in the environmental firm, mm -hmm. environmental world. And so they wanna know how do I get the verbiage for the way my brain works? And mm -hmm. I literally, they're not paying me for this, I point them to data diversity. I said, oh, <laughs> you need to go there because you can get the broad spectrum. You can sit there and I said, and you can do do internal brown bag lunches using their webinars. It's going to give you the spectrum of look at everything and then be honest with yourself about what of those intrigue you and then pursue it and go <laughs> drill deeper and learn more. Yeah, I promise we did not pay you to say that. No. no. Did Warms not. my heart. <laughs> it, 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 truly it is. You can ask anyone that I talk to at ERM. I'm constantly pointing them to go to Dataversity. That's where you find the, the broad spectrum. That's where you can drill down. You can follow these learning paths and you can get to what is my niche part of the data world. Oh, very cool. Oh, thank you for that. We're doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you are. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Lee, this has been amazing. Anything else you want to add? Um, just that I, <laughs> I love that you guys are doing this topic for um, a podcast. This is my first podcast ever. I typically um, don't. It's, I love talking to individuals. I get really nervous talking to groups. It was, you picked a topic that was going to, that, that is near, to, near and dear to my heart. So it was going to pull me in. Thank you. Please please consider doing more topics like this. I think it's very important, especially as we're looking at, there's a huge younger generation coming up behind us and there isn't a lot of mentoring and informal mentoring or formal with any of that going on for them. And they're basically coming out of college and they're being thrown in the deep end. These kind of podcasts help to point and give guidance. And that is something that I'm, passionate about is that your career is supposed to be the support for your life. So let's give you all of the information that I've attained in my 53 years. Open book, whatever you need. Oh, I love that, Lee. That is that is so lovely. And and mm -hmm. you know it's one thing that I'm hearing repeatedly about people who have been successful in data. Nobody made it on their own. Yeah. It's, you yeah. know, having mentors, having, you yes. know, building those relationships and learning, taking the time to learn. It's, it's been, it's, it's I can a common still theme. remember at 28 years old, someone asked me, okay, because I was, you know, had started on my career and I'm like, so what, how did you, how were you successful? How did you turn this on? I said, find a mentor. And they literally laughed. And I went, I'm not joking. Right. Yeah. 
find someone that is doing what looks interesting to you mm-hmm. and ask them about it. Yeah. We have to talk about ourselves. They're going to answer you. It's true. So, so many people are so more willing to talk about and help people than you think. You, you, yes. uh, I know I've been afraid to approach people before. Yes. But when I have, they were willing to open up. Yes. And I, yeah. I think we need, it is something that my generation of women, mm-hmm. it is, we are definitely passing on the knowledge of, okay, you don't have to be superwoman. You don't, the, the, right. it's a myth that you don't have to be everything and how yeah. a lot of conversation, a lot of mentor conversations around work-life balance. Is that a myth? How do you actually do it? Mm-hmm. And how do you actually maintain it over the course of your work life? Is it okay to want to work? Yes. Right. Is it okay to not want to work? Yes. <laughs> it's all okay. It's all okay. It's so very true. I, I heard a, um, I worked for Microsoft for a while and they had a women's event. Um, and one of the VPs came in and said, you know, people often talk about work-life balance and tell me that I work too much. She's like, but I love what I do. Yeah. So I feel like my life is balanced because work is not separate from life. It's part of it. Yes, exactly. Right? And that's, yeah. But we have to be sure to, because that's, I think one thing that happened to my generation and you know, women, probably a generation younger than me, is we saw these women doing all of that work. We never asked them. And we mm-hmm. assumed that's what we had to do to succeed. And it wasn't until we got to, okay, now we're the senior level. And we're going, oh, I didn't have to do that. Right. I really did. It was, what is my passion? My passion will lead me to do it more and want to be in that place. So follow that road. And then work isn't a burden. Learning the new things, keeping your knowledge up, isn't a drag or a burden or something you have to do. It's something you want to do. Yeah, exactly. My other thing that I would encourage, and it could be because I'm a very people-y governance person, is recognize that your creativity is needed in the data world. Yeah. The data world is not, as much as we talk about statistics and predictiveness and correlations and being able to visualize and being able to organize, you have to come up to put things into an operational world you have to be creative about how they will interact with humans. Find your creativity and let it come into your work. Such good advice. Oh, Lee, this has been such a pleasure to chat with you today. Uh, I really like your story. I really like the, the lessons that you bring to it. And uh, it's such you. great advice for those coming into, into careers, in any career, really. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, if somebody wanted to solicit the services of ERM, where would they go? Um, the ERM.com is our website, but you can also, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find ERM on LinkedIn, and that's probably a really good place to, to go. And um, I'll make sure that I link to this podcast so that if anybody wants to find me, they can go straight to that link. Perfect. And we'll grab those links from you too and post them on the podcast Beautiful. website. Thank you. That'd be great. Yes. Uh, Lee, thank you again so much for taking the time to chat with us today. You're welcome. And for all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest podcast and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.